This week, we welcome Patrick Heim, Dropbox Head of Security, to talk about all things security of files in the cloud, as it were. In our stories of the week, we're going to talk about how the world is going to become one big giant robot and the security implications of that. We'll also talk about a world without browser plugins. So all that and more. So stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios. In lovely Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. And bits aren't the only things getting banged. And well, you know, dim cocktails. They flow steady. It's Paul's Security Week. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. ProXPN is a leading VPN service, offering free accounts, excellent premium features, and an outstanding commitment to privacy and security online. Visit them on the web at proxpn.com and use the discount code weekly for a 50% off discount for life. Provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And here's your lovely host. He's a man who got really caught up in a catchy tune before the show, but we'll leave that for later. But let's just say, he knows they're for girls and for boys. Paul Asadorian! Welcome, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is episode 450 for February 4th, 2016. I'm, of course, joined here in studio by Mr. Larry Pesci. On the lines via Skype, we've got Mr. Jack Daniel. Welcome, Jack. Greetings. Well, He's got a thanks. cocktail. It's nice. Cocktail, yeah. yeah. Nice cocktail, Jack. Yes, it's uh, two shots of espresso, two ounces of sweetened condensed milk, uh, two ounces of rum, and some uh, cocoa and uh, coffee bitters uh, shaken over ice and strained into a big-ass glass. Wow. I'll take just everything, the rum and everything else. <laughs> rum, rum is good. <laughs> Joff! Joff Dyer is here with us. Welcome, Joff. Hey, Paul, how are you? It's, it's good to be here for another wonderful Thursday evening. With and I'm glad you put your shirt on. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Put yeah. Before the show, Joff did not have a shirt on. I did. You were I literally did. hacking naked before the show. Well, that my wife said that as I came into the office. She said, are you going to hack naked? I said, oh, yeah, why not? And so. What did you say? Oh, is that what the kids are calling it these days? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and how did that happen? Did you stand in the hallway and never mind? <laughs> no, 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 don't go there. <laughs> uh, let's see. A couple quick announcements. Vote for us, Security Weekly. You got to write it in on the ballot for the RSA Social Security Awards Best Podcast. We are, and why do you have to write it in? Because we are we not get nominated. nominated. Usually we have a picture of the vote for Pedro thing in there as well. I forgot to put that in the, the run of show thing. So, um, yeah. So you have to write in Security Weekly. Go to securityweekly.com forward slash vote. And it'll bring you right bring there. bring it right there. And you could, there it is. Thank you, guys. Vote for Security Weekly, securityweekly.com forward slash vote. 2016 Social Security Awards Best Podcast. Make sure you go do that. Yep. Write it in. Uh, our other announcement is that uh, we'd like to announce InfoSec World 2016. Yes, conference and expo April 4th through the 6th. That is at Disney's Contemporary Resort, of course, in, uh, in Disney World. It's very nice, very nice. I will, I, will not, I will not be there next week. I'll be there the week after, not at the Contemporary Resort, right, but Sands right. ICS Summit. Yes. I will be, I will be there at lovely uh, 
or Orlando, Florida, right next to Universal Studios. Excellent. Yeah, so go to infosecworld.com, check them out. Uh, I'll be presenting there some other familiar faces and maybe some not so familiar faces. Uh, so it's certainly worth checking out. Uh, it, it, it's a good conference. I went last year, nice. had a good time. There was great talks, good people. It's kind of like a, it's similar to Source in that it's kind of like a mix of the hacker-ish uh -huh, kind of uh -huh, crowd uh -huh. and business, more businessy type nice. people. Nice. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I thought it was pretty good. Nice. So uh, speaking uh, real quick, uh, I'll also be at RSA. Uh, I'm speaking nice. in the uh, interventions uh, sandbox uh, at RSA on, I believe. Wednesday. Inventions or innovation? Innovation. innovation. It's like the IoT, the innovation um, uh, smart grid, yeah. smart energy. Nice. Um, um, area. Are you in innovating something, or I, you're I just, presenting just presenting on just presenting something cool? Something gotcha. Fun. Cool. So I'll, I'll probably run into you because I'm a judge for the Innovation Sandbox. Ooh. Ooh. That's our very special guest, Mr. Patrick Heim, Drakbox oh. Head of Security. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Yes. So you have to kiss up to Patrick if he's going to be a judge. Are you entered in a competition or no? Uh, no, no. Oh, just, okay. just speaking. Yeah, because there's an innovation-like competition thing. Right. Yeah. Right. I saw a yep. couple of emails about uh, some companies that I follow that are participating in that. So. I'm I, I'm just going there to you know I got invited to go speak about something fun. Nice. And it's a it's a pretty grueling schedule for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I fly in the day before, re fairly late. Um, I speak at like 9 a.m. and as soon as I'm done speaking, I leave for the airport to go to Seattle for three days. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least so, Seattle's yeah. pretty close. Yep. Yeah. In and out. Um, yeah, it's pretty close, but it's still a six-hour flight. Really? Yeah. yeah, because I have to go from. Oh, uh, you got a connector. Go, yeah, 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 yeah. I have to connect through like Vegas or something ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's, that's the painful. wrong direction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's painful. <laughs> yep. Oh, boy. Well, Patrick, welcome to the show. Patrick, I want to start by asking you, how did you get your start in information security? Oh, boy. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to date myself as a fossil here, but uh, I was like prior to the internet days. I was out there hacking bulletin boards and telcos and trying to get free long distance and hosting. That's okay. Ja Jack invented fossils, so we're, we're good. Awesome. Okay. So... <laughs> But it was, it was like one of those things where I was like, wow, this is like so much fun. Unfortunately, now I have to go to college and get a real job because nobody actually would ever want to pay you for like going out and having fun. There was like no security industry. Mm -hmm. So went to college, did all kinds of stuff, and eventually stumbled into an opportunity with uh, Ernst & Young to become a uh, systems auditor. And from there, just kind of snowballed into security, security consulting, penetration testing. And uh, it was really just an awesome time in the late 90s uh, here in the Bay Area where we mm -hmm. had the first dot-com bubble. And there was just so much technology to be exposed to, so many opportunities. And uh, that, that kind of was like the gateway drug into security as a profession. But if you really peel it back, it's just kind of been a passion for my entire life. So are you still like based in Silicon Valley today? Yeah, Dropbox is based out of San Francisco. We're mm -hmm. right next to the AT&T ballpark. And mm -hmm. uh, right now, having a really great time dealing with all the traffic related to Super Bowl this weekend. Oh, I bet. So uh, what's, the, what's the security kind of startup scene uh, in, in Silicon Valley like today? I would say it's, it's kind of nuts. And... Uh, Actually, if I peel it back and we ask the question, kind of, what do security startups look like versus prior years? There is a lot of funding in this space, mm -hmm. and you see so many different startups. The problem is really separating kind of the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something we saw in the innovation sandbox. You know, we had a hundred applicants for uh, basically ten final or semifinalists that are going to get judged. The quality has actually been higher this year, but from a buyer side, if I just look at any space and security, especially around detection, um, there are so many cool companies that have magical claims around machine learning and AI and whatnot, and it's incredibly difficult uh, when you're in a kind of a, if you take the view of the buyer, to really figure out which ones of those have real substance behind them. Mm -hmm. and which ones are just kind of me too players because uh, somebody was able to convince a VC who was motivated to invest in security to throw some money at the problem. Right. So right, it's, it's right. kind of like the, it's kind of like best of times and the worst of times, the best of times, because there are so many companies working on interesting problems, but the problem is there are so many companies working on interesting problems that mm -hmm. it's, it's tough to sometimes figure it out. Yeah. It's interesting. And in, in most of the uh, startups, it sounds like are in the defense 
area, obviously, right? I mean, because that's where the biggest market is. Do you see any that kind of dabble in the offensive kind of security realm? Not so much. Um, on the offensive side, I would imagine most of those customers would be traditional defense agencies, and mm -hmm. they're not going to be probably advertising their services. I mean, we know right, like right, right. <laughs> and a, a few other ones out there that uh, are obviously in the business of doing this, mm -hmm. but it's it's not something where I have a lot of vendors knocking on my door saying, I want to show you this cool new offensive hacking tool that I have. Right, right. Um, we, we can't. Talk about Jack. startups without me saying, what's what's your take on the state of bubble? A um, couple of things have happened in the past week, and I won't name company names, and I Norse. don't think they're directly related yeah. to the bubble. <laughs> but um, uh, Well, Nor Norse is one, and uh, Barracuda, since we're going to name names, uh, Barracuda is far from being a startup, but they missed, um, they missed earnings, and the result of missing earnings was just stunning. The value of the company uh, dropped by over two thirds uh, in a couple of days. And I, I wonder if that's, uh, you know, like you said, there's still see a lot of money going around. Certainly at, at Tenable, we just took, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars. So the money's there, but what are your thoughts on, on bubble versus not bubble? Is it, is it coming down to quality of the company as, and things like that? I'm going to avoid on bubble speculation, but I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, which is there are an awful lot of companies and there are too many of them for them all to survive. And sometimes I think the survivors are going to be the ones that have the better marketing and go-to-market plans and positioning than actually the ones that have great technology. So and it's not about who has the best technology. That's interesting you say that, Patrick. People have, told, people have told me that for, for years. That, yeah, not always, but uh, in general, right, it's yeah. usually the people with the other things that are not necessarily technology-related. So, I mean, my signal on this is we've got a great corporate development team. And, you know, as there are companies that have uh, really interesting IP, but it's clear that, you know, they aren't going to be able to break through uh, their VCs and others try to find good homes for them. So, we you know, we see some of these opportunities uh, across our path. And it feels like uh, the volume, I mean, this is the volume of pretty decent quality companies, when judged from a technology perspective, has been kind of increasing in terms of opportunities for us to look at from an acquisition perspective. Certainly, though, I don't see the market shrinking for security services. I see it growing. Yeah. yeah. So um, the overall market has to grow. Mm. Right, right. <laughs> but I, I think the other cycle that it's kind of evident to me is that security and large-scale companies, that's to be proven. In other words, if you look at what's driving excitement is there is a sweet spot when a company has broken through, they're getting momentum, they're super innovative, and they're recognized for that because they're solving real problems, and they have you know, pretty rapid growth. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, the company goes public, is acquired, whatever. That the, the, it's, it's almost like the life cycle of a company in the security space, a viable life cycle is maybe four to six years or so. And then mm -hmm. after they've reached a certain scale or they get acquired, this is obviously generalities, basically, they lose some of that innovative edge. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in time, they become kind of a me too player and uh, the value they actually provide declines. And that's kind of my overlay maybe to the, the dynamic we're seeing is that uh, the old adage, there is no IBM of security. The reason is that uh, security companies have to be phenomenally agile to continuously mm -hmm. add value. And as soon as they're consolidated into large companies, I, I think agility and innovation suffer, and we kind of see the outcome of that. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I agree with you, Patrick, very much so. Um, so this is interesting. I didn't know we were going to go here in, in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> this is like totally unexpected, but uh, it, well, it, it, that's it's good. good. Now, Patrick, good. have you seen the HBO series Silicon Valley? Oh, yeah, totally. And so now are you, um, uh, I don't know what exactly your role is with startups, but you've been in Silicon Valley for a while, right? Um, how close to that uh, the reality is, is that TV series? Um. I've asked several VCs. It's like one of the questions, whenever I talk to a VC, I ask them, what do you think of the TV show Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. and, and the general response is, it's so close to home that I refuse to watch it because it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that, I mean, knowing what I know, uh, you know about the industry, about startups and technology, I was like, that seems pretty spot on to me, but I always like to ask other people like you, you as well and, uh, and kind of get their take on it too. And 
everyone pretty much says, yeah, that, that's pretty spot on. So, yeah. and their tech is pretty spot on in that show, um, and it is absolutely hilarious. Like someone sent me an email that was talking about a SWOT analysis. And I sent them the video from Silicon Valley. Have you seen the show yet, Larry? I have not. Okay. I sent them the video where the uh, like nerdy corporate nerd guy yeah. is like telling the uh, startup team in the startup company about a SWOT analysis. It is absolutely hilarious. So, he's like, I'm going to SWAT you. And he's like, oh, we could totally SWAT each other. <laughs> and he's like, this is how you do it. And he looks down. And then when he looks up, like everyone has walking away. And one of the guys is just like head buried in the computer coding. <laughs> it's classic. I've, I've got a, a totally fun story on Silicon Valley as well. So uh, at Dropbox, we do these hack weeks where mm -hmm. basically a bunch of folks take time off and they pursue a really interesting, whatever the engineering challenges they want to tackle. Mm -hmm. And one of the groups... Um, looked at video compression and uh, they basically were inspired by Silicon Valley. Yeah. So they named their like Hack Week project uh, Pied Piper and they wanted to see if they can actually squeeze more compression out of pre-compressed uh, MPEG videos. And uh, Did they MPEG come up with a middle out compression algorithm? I, I, I'm not going to answer that, but I can, talk to, uh, I can talk to that they were able, I think they were able to achieve double digit um, uh, additional compression over pre-compressed, um, uh, basically MPEG encoded video. So I'm losing the details. It was about six months ago, but it was pretty phenomenal. I mean, it really spoke to the talent that we have. And uh, when they put their minds to doing something crazy like that, what they can come up with in less than a week. That's really cool. That's a lot of fun. I do, I do strongly recommend that show to anyone in, uh, security or anyone in technology, really. It's actually it's actually good because we're sort fun. of at the we're at the end of our binge watched. Stuff. I'll tell you this: so. if you don't like literally pee yourself laughing at the last episode of season one, season one, <laughs> I would be. I, I I've never laughed that hard at a TV show in my entire life. Awesome. Like that, and I hate to set the expectation that high, but you know Patrick's nodding his head in agreement. Okay. It's. It is really like that. I mean, you really have to be in technology for it to be that funny. I think if you're not in technology, it's funny. Like, okay. okay. But if you're in technology, I mean, it is just like a complete riot. I, I think of it all the time and like snicker to myself. And how many startups do you see or companies that you see, in, even in security, that want to make the world a better place? <laughs> Them. All of them, right? Because <laughs> like you said, we're focused on defensive technologies and we all yeah. want to make the world a better place. I've actually seen that in some companies' mo marketing and they mock that in, in nice. the show. That's, nice. why, that's why I mentioned that. So, cool. um, Patrick, um, I want to talk about Dropbox. And the, the first question I have is somewhat, I don't know if it's controversial, right? But it, uh, it's kind of an image thing about Dropbox. And I, I'll be honest, I've been a Dropbox user for a long time. I don't want to say since day one, but it was pretty early on. Yeah, same Yeah, way. we were using yeah. Dropbox. I, even the, the show really yeah. is what sparked us to use Dropbox because we had to share files with each other, right? Go figure. Um, but and FTP is just... FTP is just <laughs> terrible, right? <laughs> so, but when I talk to organizations about Dropbox... They're like, oh, we don't want our users to use Dropbox. When I talk to security companies about Dropbox, they're like, oh, yeah, we can detect Dropbox so you can get rid of it in your environment. <laughs> and being an early adopter of the technology, well, I'm like, like but why, why would you? Do? I mean, I understand from yeah. a security reason why, it, but I'm it, like, it, this is still great technology. Yep. So why would you do this? So I wanted if you could just address that perception issue that people associate Dropbox with insecurity. You know what, I, I think it's because of our consumer roots and the perception, it's a real perception. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I'm here is because a couple of years ago, we finally decided as a company that, hey, you know what, we actually want our product to be credible for businesses. Mm -hmm. So we created a product called Dropbox Business and now kind of a version of it called Dropbox Enterprise, where basically the story is, hey, you know what, if you want additional visibility and control uh, over a tool that your employees, employees already love to utilize and that is super efficient and, you know, it's like 400 million people around the world are using. So from a collaboration value perspective is immense. Uh, we've got that tool for you now. So if the security concerns out there, um, frankly, you know, it's like take in your business, take a look at Dropbox business. And if you're a consumer, um, peel back why you have security concerns. Uh, the reality is that if we actually look at what causes uh, breaches and data loss, it's not because we have some kind of esoteric bug or something within the product. It's almost completely because we have people with 
bad credentials. They were using their credentials. Someplace else gets hacked, and their passwords get tested uh -huh. against Dropbox. Stuff gets compromised, and we have to detect it and block it and shut it down and whatnot. So it's the, I mean, that's not... I, 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 I might also... I might also argue the uh, the endpoint as well that the endpoint gets compromised Absolutely. with cache credentials to, mm -hmm. to Dropbox and yep. they, they do some or that, that you know that shareable well. link gets shared right <laughs> it's, yeah. you know it's, yeah. it's, the yeah. shareable link doesn't imply that there's any kind of security or privacy right it's yeah, by default on, shareable it's shareable for a reason yes. <laughs> I, I always um, uh, advise people, you know, if they're going to use something like Dropbox and you don't have visibility or control uh, into the technology itself, that you need to control it on the user end and educate. Hey, look, like we know what we put on Dropbox is stuff that after we edit it is going to be public anyway, right? We use it to share a lot of audio and video files with each other and pass it back and forth between the team. And it's just more convenient than USB thumb drive or, you know, sometimes we're halfway across the world or the country yeah. and we have to be able to share. I mean, we used it for a long time oh, yeah. early yeah. on when, when Larry and I were like the ones editing audio. Now, like we have people for that. Right? <laughs> yeah, we've got <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, if you're, if you're a business and you're looking at Dropbox, uh, reality is we like all kinds of certifications, ISO 27001, ISO 27018, you name it basically. So, uh, external scrutiny is intense. We subscribe to a bug bounty and um, basically pay people to find vulnerabilities uh, mm -hmm. on Dropbox. Uh, so on top of that, gosh, we have like the SOC 1, 2, and 3 reports. So if you're a business customer under NDA, we'll give you the complete list of all of our controls and how Ernst & Young has assessed them. So it's like the reality is if you get beyond the perception and you actually dig into it, we are pretty phenomenally secure in terms of... But, the, but that doesn't change user behavior and prevent people from sharing things they shouldn't, right? I don't know. It's, it's, it's clear that there is kind of this line around provider accountability and uh, kind of customer accountability. As a matter of fact, there is a new ISO standard 27,017, and one of the requirements is that cloud providers uh, very clearly articulate what are the customer's accountabilities versus the provider's mm -hmm. accountabilities, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which, is, which is pretty awesome because I've seen, like, one of the challenges being this misperception that if you put it into a cloud storage provider or to use one of those, that, hey, all of your problems disappear. And <laughs> not that easy. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a really great case to be made that for the accountabilities that cloud companies have, they are significantly more secure than if you were to try to do this yourself in-house. Right, but right. For the other accountabilities, there are a lot of them, especially around authentication, access management, and monitoring that very squarely still fall into the camp of the individual user or the customer organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I will also argue some of that customer organization stuff. I mean, and we think about from the user perspective that I think maybe from a business perspective, folks are very concerned that, hey, we're providing our data and we're putting it someplace that is a third party. And yeah. regardless of all the controls, there's still a lot of question about we're providing potentially sensitive data to a third party. We're not providing it to them, but we're storing it at a third party. And what happens if that gets accessed? So in the cases where I've used it to store sensitive data, Guess what? It's my responsibility to encrypt it before it goes there. And, well, I have. <laughs> so, and then pass those passwords out of band and so forth and so on. So, that's on me. Mm -hmm. So, what what types of controls do your business and enterprise customers get? So, when you look at uh, Dropbox Enterprise, so we'll just, that's kind of like the flagship product. Mm -hmm. uh, you have all kinds of controls for like uh, limiting the sharing capabilities inside and outside the organization, forcing SAML authentication so that uh, you don't have to worry about users having bad password choices out on the internet, uh, forcing two-factor authentication. There is now a domain management feature that allows you to kind of force convert, uh, for lack of a better term, all of the personal users with it that signed up using the domain of your company to use the business version that has the monitoring. Obviously, you have full access to all the audit logs via API or the web interface, so there's an awful lot you can do with that. There's also access to um, the, the API itself, the Dropbox Business API, which integrates with a bunch of different security companies. Um, so, for example, if you want to do DLP, there are companies like CloudLock that integrate via the API to provide all kinds of DLP capabilities. If nice. you want to do an additional layer of encryption with like enterprise rights management technology, there are companies like Vera that also have a degree of API integration with Dropbox. Mm -hmm. So kind of our philosophy has been that if you're a large enterprise, 
you're going to have a security infrastructure in place. And some of these problems, like monitoring, for example, need to be solved horizontally across the enterprise, not just kind of within a single product. So we, we look at this and go, okay, well, what are we going to build? We, know, we need to build core features, uh, tweaks around how you can use Dropbox. But when we start getting into like advanced capabilities like DLP, for example, it doesn't make sense for us to build a really robust capability because it's something that requires a horizontal view Chances are your security uh, engineers and administrators only want to look at one console and not have to log into a Dropbox one. Uh, you have to be able to correlate event, events across multiple systems, et cetera. So you know, this is kind of sharing our philosophy using DLP as an example, that uh, for many of the more advanced security capabilities, our strategy has been one of enabling partners with APIs and identifying really good partners because large companies are going to have existing security infrastructures. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not a huge fan of DLP as the technology, a security technology. Um, it's one part to your... Yeah, well, home. I mean, although it, it makes, I, I think, a little more sense in this case because you can really focus it in on mm -hmm. files being shared via Dropbox, yeah. and, and it can narrow the focus. I think where it starts to fall down is when you start monitoring all the network traffic and start yeah, calling it DLP. There's just too much to look at. And by the way, you earlier mentioned there are a bunch of companies out there that will like have a product they put on your network and like, oh my God, everybody's using Dropbox, uh, shouldn't you be scared? Um, it's, it's actually an awesome story for us because our value prop is, yeah, you know what, if you are concerned about individual use of Dropbox, we now actually have this business product where you pay us a couple of bucks a month and you kind of get to preserve the user experience and the benefits the users have as well mm -hmm. as now you can integrate it into your security infrastructure, apply the monitoring and controls, and everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, no, we actually, uh, I work with a group that... Uh, uh, just implemented Dropbox and had to convert my personal account to a business account, which was cool because I hadn't used my personal one for anything in a while and used my other one for work when needed. Mm -hmm. So it, it worked out great, and yeah, I totally get it. Um, I was and I was shocked to find yeah. out that the, the whole business thing existed. I'm like, wow, what's, this is this is cool. What's kind of wild though, we're actually seeing a trend now where CISOs are coming to Dropbox and driving the discussion around buying Dropbox for their businesses because they view it as a risk management investment. So it's it's almost like buying a security tool. It's like if your employees are already using Dropbox and you're not in a position that you can just block everything, or you know, quite frankly, there's a solid value prop between just formally with formally adopting it. They're looking at this going, well, you know, it's probably not a good idea for me to ignore the fact that you have these consumers, you know, consumer technologies in the enterprise. Let's just figure out a way of making it legit. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of cool and unexpected that we're seeing. Well, in like, the nice part, CISOs. the nice part with that, too, and, and, you know, some of my concerns are if people are using Dropbox and they're putting files that the company owns, you know, what happens when that person leaves the company? <laughs> and now uh -huh. they've got this Dropbox that you didn't know about, and they could have all this stuff in there. At least when, if you can control that, which I'm assuming you can, you can provision user access to that and take it away when an employee leaves. Totally. Yeah, that, that's, that's super useful. Yeah, same, same sort of thing, too, when, uh, when I converted my personal to the business. There's no one going back from that. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's no going yeah. back from that. I got you. Um, I, I think that ahead, like Jack. a lot of a lot of things in security, the when you attempt to outright block things, uh, people try to circumvent you, and mm -hmm. oftentimes, whether it's mobile devices or Dropbox or or other email systems, yeah. uh, actively making the decision to manage it uh, is is the right choice, even though it may seem like a little bit more work. It's actually in the long run. Um, the right way to do it. It's, it's cloud service providers, right? They come up with a corporate policy for Amazon Rackspace, Cloud Sigma, whoever it is, make it easy for people to do the right thing in a managed environment, and then uh, everything gets better. Totally. Well, it's like an organization that we know, Jack, that converted to Google Apps for Business, and... A lot you're making. Of us, you're going to make me go get another drink right now. A lot of us were already using Google to share documents or chat Stop or whatever it. the case Stop may it. be. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to go put a spout on a bottle. So yeah, but what it what it what it amounts to though is a, <laughs> is a, uh, a migration of of shadow IT into sanctioned IT, which is you know I think is pretty important because you are embracing that and bringing stuff literally out of the shadows. 
Um, yeah, totally sharing my, or totally stealing my tagline. I actually use shadow <laughs> IT. Is the, <laughs> Sorry. No, seriously, it's like I use this tagline <laughs> called "Shadow IT is the new IT," and you've got to listen to your employees and actually see what you're, what they are using, what they're using to be productive, and figure out a way of like legitimizing or at least monitoring it. Uh, if you're not doing that. Um, you're going to lose. But if your approach is, I'm just going to block it, I've seen that backfire in big ways. Uh, I had a guy in a healthcare company, CISO, that I know come to me and basically say that, hey, you know, we detected uh, there were a bunch of uh, docs using Dropbox. So I warned them and then shut it down. And he goes, well, that was a big mistake because not only did it now reduce his leverage with those very influential people in the organization who viewed them as him as being irrational and punitive, but uh, <laughs> which is a big deal. Uh, um, but also, when he kept monitoring, the activity just shifted to other kind of sketchier services. So he actually increased the risk to his organization by trying to control it by blocking something. And mm -hmm. it's, it's counterintuitive until you actually think about human nature, which is the, the demand, the kind of the pressure. It's kind of like squeezing a balloon. If you squeeze it on one end, the pressure doesn't go away. It just goes somewhere else. Somewhere else. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's and, exactly right. right? And, 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 and that was... And, that was Sorry, Jeff. Uh, to, to oh, I was, was going to say. I mean, the, the central IT organizations um, have a significant risk of, of sort of relegating themselves into obsolescence if they uh, if they take that course of action. So it's much better to analyze the trends and and uh, be strategic about those choices um, and uh, you know do, do the right thing uh, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. I, from when I was doing doing that in healthcare, you know, uh, I, I learned a very valuable lesson that security... Always was, put your Johnny on open in the back and not the front. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Always in the back. Which makes it harder to tie. I don't understand, I don't understand that. that. Uh, <laughs> but no, the, the, the lesson that I learned was uh, security is not about saying no. It's about saying yes, but. Yes, but that here are the risks and here are some things that you can do to mitigate those risks or not mitigate those risks and here are some other uh, possible workable pro solutions it's it's it should never be a you can't do this because security it's a you yes can do but this, here's how you do this but here's what's going to happen if we do do this and here's some things mm -hmm. that we can do to improve the solution it, which which means security is ultimately about an, an educational process um, because you always get into that mode and that mindset of going okay well this is what's happening situationally um, and this is what it means to the organization, and it's my job to translate that and educate people about what risks are entailed in, in those behaviors and try to guide people in the right direction. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so um, I had a question for you, Patrick, uh, about Dropbox and how you work with the security uh, community. Wow, okay. Um Fair amount. So uh, we participate with like threat information sharing with the um, the threat exchange that uh, Facebook hosts. So we uh, work with that. We also have more informal kind of circle of trust uh, mm -hmm. relationships, a lot of them with various uh, security groups and security professionals. Uh, I participate in something called the Bay Area CSO Council, where we have a bunch of, as you would think, Bay Area technology CSOs collaborating all the time on uh, kind of security related topics. Uh, you know, we haven't been super upfront yet with uh, coming up with big open source projects that we're releasing or anything like that. But mm -hmm. you know, that's quite frankly, because we're still a small short organization. Uh, it's not a lack of intent. Uh, we try to be super transparent and participate in the security community wherever we can. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, so do your, uh, I'm assuming you have security teams at Dropbox. Are they presenting at any conferences or uh, doing anything like that in, inside the community as well? Yeah, from an engineering perspective, it's um, basically what are you working on that you want to present? So mm -hmm. there's no requirement that any of our engineers go out and present something, but uh, we've got one person right now who's uh, working on some really cool research on uh, password strength and actually gauging password strength with an algorithm versus kind of silly rules and uh, running experiments. And actually, you know, it's, it's frankly an awesome science experiment. And uh, so that's an example of something we're both open sourcing and we're going to be sharing some of the research on. Mm -hmm. Really cool. What's it like to work at Dropbox? Is it oh is God. it is it like I think <laughs> most Silicon Valley companies are, where you know there's foosball tables in everyone's office, kind of thing, and beer taps in the in the kitchen. No, I mean we don't need foosball tables and beer taps. I mean literally, you know, it's like there will be coolers all around with beer. 
um, on like Fridays, especially we actually have professional bartenders come in and the area we call the drop bar and everybody just kind of hangs out. I, I would say the biggest draw in terms of if you're looking for like over the top uh, perks and in tech industries is quite frankly, the food. Um, we have this tuck shop as it's called a British term for like a sweet shop. I think it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the food they produce is phenomenal. Uh, we recently hired our first pastry chef who joined us, uh, who actually joined us, I think from a three Michelin star restaurant. So oh, you can probably guess that we're pretty damn spoiled when it comes to food. And, and do, you, do you have a gym on site as well? We do have a gym on site. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so you can eat pastries the, after, after, you know, after five o'clock and then next morning hit the gym. And uh, correct. And if you had the before and current picture of me, meaning before joining Dropbox and right now, you could probably tell that I haven't taken as much advantage of the gym as I probably should. <laughs> well, they want you to stay there, Patrick, right? I mean, that's why they have the fabulous food. They don't want you to go home. They want you to keep doing fabulous things for Dropbox. I, I wouldn't say that there is such a nefarious motive, but uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, any other questions for Patrick? I cannot think of any. I don't know why I have to look up the five questions. You'd think I would know these Jeez. by now, right? But I just, I can't, I, I struggle delivering them without reading them. Uh, um, Should I do it? Yeah, you want to do it? Let's mix yeah. it up. Let's see if you can right. do it without, without looking at the notes. All right, Patrick, so Larry is going to ask you the five questions. And I'm assuming you've never, uh, we've well, never been on the show, so you haven't played five questions with Security Weekly. No, I have not. You probably have not okay. been prepped for five questions with Security Weekly. Which is perfect. Which is just the way we like it. Okay. So, five questions. Go. Three words to describe yourself. Thoughtful. Impatient. Indecisive. <laughs> <laughs> tall, 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 handsome, and a liar. <laughs> the third word there. I have no idea. Okay. All right. Uh, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, clearly a knife. Okay. Uh, if you had to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? From Confusion to Chaos. Mm. <laughs> so I think I may be missing one question. Nope, you're good. You're doing great, Larry. Keep um, going. Uh, I could not do the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. No, yeah. Uh, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, would you prefer to go first or second? I defer my answer on that because I have no idea what the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby is. It's, it's a little bit more popular in Europe, so it's understandable. <laughs> oh, that's just an excuse. You know what? He pleads the fifth. We'll take that. <laughs> my, my, we'll take you know, that. Like, when, when I just said Ask Grabby Grabby uh, aloud, the, my, uh, my friend here, my colleague from our communications team is like, turns and it's like, what the hell is All right. <laughs> All right, and the final out of five questions, choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive or dead, fictional or otherwise. Oh, God, I absolutely hate all celebrities. I'm like an anti-celebrity person. So, well, that's not, so, yeah. so a celebrity give, in your own mind. It has yeah. to be a celebrity in your own mind. You know what? Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Bill Gates, so I've got to say that uh, he's an, a person I totally admire. And, uh, gosh, on the, on the mother side of the equation, who, who would be a great pair with Bill Gates? Um, now, now that said, this is welcome to 2016. Um, 2016. It does, okay. It does not have to be a heterosexual couple if you don't want it to be. Because if you're inspired by two <laughs> women or two men, then that is perfectly right. okay. But but I mean, if I'm choosing people who contributed genetic material to me, which is kind of the way I see this question, okay. then yeah. it's kind of limiting to like having somebody else who actually. <laughs> yes. 